Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Peace Bagasha. I am a consultant renal physician and I do palliative care as well. I'm here to talk about uh, inequities in chronic illnesses, especially looking at um, renal disease and diabetes. Um, so, so we'll begin by talking about um, what we have so far, um, life as, as it is, and then we'll talk about what it is that we want and then um, what it is that we can do for the patients that we look after. So um, in 2002, the National Kidney Foundation uh, conceptualized what kidney disease is, and they conceptualized it as a spectrum of illness from the normal to when you eventually develop kidney failure. Um, uh, this is a good uh, way of looking at kidney disease because it helps you to, to uh, look at patients from right from when they uh, become unwell, when they become um, unwell all the way to before they become unwell so that you're able to um, look uh, to, to uh, care for them in a, in, in a way which, uh, which minimizes um, the expenses and, and, and the cost on the patient and the healthcare system. So um, this is a heat map uh, for chronic kidney disease developed by the uh, Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, which looks at the spectrum of patients who have um, kidney disease. Again, it helps us to prognosticate and to uh, know which patients are developed in stage and therefore need renal replacement therapies and which patients are in the early stages. The idea is that you should uh, catch a patient in the early stage as when they're in the green area before they move on to the red area, because the red area, they're developed end-stage kidney disease, and at that point, uh, options of care are very limited and often inaccessible. Um, again, uh, kidney disease and diabetes are uh, a huge, um, contribute significantly to mortality. Patients who have both kidney disease and diabetes usually will end up uh, not doing well. So if a patient has the two, it's always very good to make sure that you um, try to delay progression as much as you can. Um, so once a patient does develop end-stage kidney disease, then really options for care are that they will either need comprehensive conservative management, hemodialysis, or kidney transplant. Um, in our setting in Uganda, we don't have peritoneal dialysis available to patients, although it would have been a good option. Most of our patients end up on hemodialysis, and I'll talk later about how um, we do end up, we have much more hemodialysis than peritoneal dialysis in developing um, or, or low middle income countries. Um, so uh, this helps us really to look at what patients end up in with in regards to um, the modalities for renal replacement therapy. Um, and this is hugely defined by where they uh, are, uh, which part of the world they are. So in the more developed countries, you'll find that uh, patients will end up getting uh, kidney transplants and home hemodialysis. Uh, which would be the good option, the better options, because uh, patients are able to have uh, control what they can or cannot do. Um, unlike when they have dialysis, in which case um, they are tied to a, a renal unit. Um, so the blue is the patients who get kidney tra uh, transplants, and the red is the ones who end up on dialysis. Um, so again, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and resource-limited settings, not many patients uh, end up on renal replacement therapies of any kind, mainly because of inaccessibility of these modalities. So um, in my country, in Uganda, we don't have um, places where you can have renal replacement, uh, where you can have kidney disease um, training. Um, so that you can become a nephrologist. So I was fortunate enough to get um, training in Canada. Um, this is a picture of me um, seeing um, a young man who was about to receive his, um, must have been his third kidney. Um, and to me, that was really uh, like an out of this world experience because uh, getting one kidney alone is, is, is a big deal for most patients. Um, and then coming back to practice in Uganda, um, where uh, you don't have many of the things that you learn about, it's, it's a, a bit of an adjustment, but I think it's a, a good way of looking at where we are going and where we are heading and finding ways of adjusting and um, doing what is that you can do for the patient within the resources that you have. 
Um, so in, in, in Uganda, we don't have that many nephrologists uh, to serve the big population that we have. We don't have that many hemodialysis machines. Costs of care are quite expensive, considering the fact that almost 70% uh, of our population um, don't make that much. Um, and then even, well, me, not yet as senior consultant, but as a consultant, if I was to get uh, renal replacement therapy, it would really be um, a big cost to me and would not only uh, be a cost to me, but also to my family and to the people around me. So it's usually a big decision when you put someone on hemodialysis in a setting such as ours. And also given the fact that accessibility is not um, as easy as you would think, um, for example, in Uganda, we have only two places. So this is Kampala, this is Central Uganda, this is Mbara. So patients can only get hemodialysis in these two different areas. So if a patient came from, for example, Adjumani, where Vicky is, it would be really difficult for them to be able to commute. Um, it takes you about maybe 12 hours to travel. Um, so you can't do that back and forth three times a week. Um, this quote from one of my patients, I think uh, elucidates this really well. When you are on hemodialysis, you have to um, travel and only stay in the center where you can access it. And because of that, patients end up separating from their families, from their livelihoods, from their support systems. So it's really a big decision when you decide to put a patient on hemodialysis. Um, and on top of that, outcomes are not usually uh, very good. Most patients cannot um, sustain more than three months of hemodialysis. Mortality is quite high. So when patients usually begin, they have a lot of their family members around them rallying, uh, you know, um, mobilizing fans, coming to look after them and, and, and being there with them in the hospital. But when it becomes a chronic illness and goes into the third month, the fourth month, the fifth month, eventually they'll remain probably with uh, a spouse or with a child, and then life becomes very difficult for these patients. So um, what is it that we want to do for our patients? So we want our patients to have a good quality of life. I'm a PhD student right now, and I'm studying what it takes to for patients to have a good quality of life. And what I have found is that many of our patients, um, whether they are on hemodialysis or they are not on hemodialysis, have almost an equal quality of life. So that means that we are putting patients um, at a high, co uh, giving. Uh, putting them to, um, onto a treatment that uh, impacts significantly on their community and not really looking at what it is that they benefit out of this treatment. Um, so therefore it becomes really important for us to be able to modify what expectations we are giving to these patients um, so that we can be able to improve the outcomes of these patients. Because if the reality and, and what the patients expect to get are, are, are very significantly different, then we find that um, patients will not feel like they have benefited um, from the investment that they have made into their care. And especially in a setting whereby there's no um, health insurance uh, scheme and patients are paying out of their pockets, it's, it's a huge decision to decide that they're um, going to 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 forego so many things to be able to um, live a little bit longer. Um, this is one of the quotes from one of my early 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 patients um, who made me think about what it is that we offer to our patients. Um, if we are um, making them uh, pay for their health care, what benefits do they get out of it? And what is the impact on the people around them? It's something that we have to think about every time we make decisions, treatment decisions for patients. Um, so just looking at what it is that you can do for the patient and what it is that you cannot do for a patient helps you to decide to what limits you can go and, and decide whether you are failing at what you're doing or not failing at what you're doing. Um, I always uh, think this is a, a good way of seeing um, if the patient is finding meaning in their lives, if the patient is feeling like, um, like they're, they're satisfied with their lives and whatever it is that you're providing for them is probably working. And uh, if you find that you know, a patient is not happy, um, their family and they're not happy, um, then maybe you need to reevaluate and think again what it is that you need to change in the care that you're providing for the patient. Um, so equity and deciding what it is that you need to give up for a patient is, is a difficult um, thing that uh, is a difficult 
aspect to the care that you give. Um, many times you have to know the patient, um, I'd like to say inside out, but many times you really have to know your patient well um, to be able to decide what it is that they want because uh, it's not always one size fits all for all the patients. Um, ideally you should liberate them, take away all the barriers that they have, but that's not always a reality. So then what it is is that you have to make sure you know um, the patient and then decide what it is that they need and what it is that you can provide and come to a compromise. So the progress of science of Saharan Africa is that we are having more and more nephrologists over the past 10 years. We're having more and more dialysis centers. Um, more patients are being able to get onto dialysis um, because the prices are coming down. Um, and then we are still having more dialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And this is something that we need to do something about. Um, and then we're having more countries providing uh, kidney transplants. Um, before, most patients had to travel abroad, like in Uganda, most patients have to travel abroad to get a kidney transplant, which is quite costly. Um, therefore, it becomes expensive and becomes almost a non-reality for many of the patients that we look after. Um, uh, again, it is not really equitable the way in which all of this progress is happening. You find that uh, the more developed countries, even within Africa, are having more access to renal replacement therapy. But it's still positive to find to think about the fact that we are still doing uh, almost as well as the rest of the world. So, what it is that we can do? How can we uh, make life better? Um, I think we need to focus and see what is the most cost-effective way to look after these patients. And one of the things that really, really would uh, contribute uh, the most significantly would be focusing on prevention and screening so that we don't get patients who have reached the end of the road, at which point treatment can be quite costly. Um, and then integration of care is really key so that even a patient who comes from malaria um, as they are screened to see how their kidney function is doing. Because many times we get patients who come in and they have end-stage kidney disease, they are, they, are, uh, they are not making any urine at all, at which point really it becomes difficult to uh, integrate care. So integration of care at the primary uh, care level would have been the best uh, option and is actually what we would focus on more than anything. Um, so uh, if you cannot provide, if you cannot provide hemodialysis or transplant for a patient, what can you give? Um, you don't, you wouldn't throw up your hands and say there's nothing I can do for my patient. Um, palliative care becomes therefore a key um, aspect to care. And um, you need to know how you're going to identify the patients who would most benefit from palliative care. At the end of the day, patients will decide for themselves what it is that they want. And I find that many times um, patients know exactly what it is that they want, um, but giving them the options and telling them uh, what it is, what is what is going to cost, what is going to involve, um, the fact that you have to um, re relocate, probably leave your job, your livelihood. It becomes very important for patients to decide. And I think this is a good model when you think about, for example, if um, uh, a son brings in his father and, and he tells you that you know his father really likes being in the village, really likes looking after his cattle, looking after his farm. And then you tell him that, okay, now you have to move and to the urban area, leave your village, leave your home then it really helps for the father to know what he is getting himself into before you start him um, on, on a therapy like dialysis or kidney transplant. So um, having conservative maximum conservative management as an option is, has been really helpful, I have found in my experience. Um, the good thing with palliative care is that it provides a holistic um, approach to care. You not only look at the physical, which is what most physicians or um, care provider will think of, but you look at the social, psychological and spiritual aspects for the patient. What do they value? I find that many patients who have been on dialysis for a long time and are thinking about um, stopping dialysis. If you discuss the spiritual aspects of the care, um, they, most of them will find, you'll find that that is what keeps them going. That is what um, helps them to keep rallying their families. And Uganda is, I find, are found to be a very spiritual um, um, place. People believe in God a lot and believe that God will handle. Um, and therefore, you find that it's an easy discussion to bring up. And I've also found that when it comes to elderly patients, 
helps them to decide that they don't want to do dialysis, that this is what God has chosen for them, and therefore they would prefer to um, go the conservative route. So engaging in early palliative care discussions for these patients has been very helpful. And it makes you, um, as a physician, have a sense of um, the fact that you're doing much more for the patient than um, feeling helpless, that you cannot provide much more. I thank you all very much for listening, and I hope that you have really enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much.